Good afternoon, all the students. Okay, so this is the second week of your Dhamma study journey. Altogether, it will be 15 weeks long. And today is the 4th of February, 2024. I'm glad everyone can make it. Uh, dedicate your time to study the teaching of the Buddha. For me, I feel fortunate and grateful to have a chance to study Dhamma for myself and have a chance to share the teaching of the Buddha to people like you guys, everyone from around the world. So let's get started. But today let's do something slightly different because uh, I like everyone to have a rest just a little bit, maybe one minute to be quiet, bring your mind back to yourself and meditate together for just one minute before we start the Dhamma subject. wish we could have more time to meditate together. What else would be better than just sit back and relax and be with ourselves fully, body and mind? To me, the best time of the day for myself, besides study, the Tipitaka is just to meditate alone. I have my favorite place here at the Ai Monastery where I can be secluded. I can spend time with myself all day long. If I don't have anything to do, that's uh, where I will be going to, to be with myself. But we have duty to do. Okay? We have responsibilities. And today is my turn to uh, share with you the Dhamma uh, subject, the second week, as, as I mentioned. One hour and 30 minutes. Hope everyone's doing okay. This is only the second week. Still many weeks to go. For some of you that new to Buddhism, you may feel overwhelming with the Pali terms. Uh, yesterday you learned the Vinaya, you learned the story of the Buddha, and today you continue with the, the Buddhist proverb, which go to many words already. And again, this afternoon is the last session of this week. Uh, you will be learning the Dhamma subject, which is the Dhamma in the group number three. There are many of them, so I'll select only three of them to share with you, but I would like I may go a little bit deeper than what uh, actually mentioned in the books. So if you feel overwhelming, okay, uh, step back. Uh, go back and relearn and my intention that I mentioned to you last week is whoever come to the teaching of the Buddha you come to the path of happiness so that means when you study Dhamma you should be happy the Dhamma that you learn should help you to live life happier and better and that's the bottom line why you come to the class you're not here to compete with each other to make good grade to get an honor in the class but you're here to to learn something that valuable that you can use into your real life. That's the idea of learning Dhamma. But Dhamma has so many material to go through, right? It's a lot of things in the Buddhist text. It's difficult for someone who wants to study Dhamma and find a way to study them all properly. In this curriculum, it's designed to help you. If you go with us along the way from the elementary level, intermediate level, and to the advanced level, my job here in this subject is to, to walk you through the Sutta Pitaka which is said has 21,000 teaching of the Buddha. But we cannot cover all of them. Pretty much as I look through all these three levels, the teaching material, I notice that there are many important teaching of the Buddha laid out here in these three levels. But again, it doesn't mean elementary level is easier than the advanced level. Depend on the teacher and the student that we can discuss and then and we can go deep. Like today, I will touch on something. It's not something that mentioned in the book that we read, right? 
here in the the book that you have okay the elementary level i believe you can sit down and about one hour and two hour you can finish them all but most of them is more like a definition right what is sati mindfulness and then they give mindfulness definition what is sampachanya and they give sampachanya definition this is what we learned from last week right just recap real quick we learned the dhamma group two the reason it called group two because there are two things that buddha mentioned together in pair uh, you need to practice both of them fully you cannot separate so the first one is called virtue of great assistant and then uh, the, the two item on the list right the sati or mindfulness and the sampachanya or the clear comprehension hope you still remember and talking about sati and sampachanya alone we can go through the sati patthana sutra we can spend easily four or five session just to talk about this but in the elementary level we just cannot and as i look through it all the way through the advanced level many of the item of the dhamma that we learn in this elementary level we may not come back and talk about it again if you don't study deeper by yourself your dhamma knowledge would be still considered superficial you know what sati you know what sampachanya you know what hiri otapa moral shame moral fear you know what is khanti or patience the soracha or gentleness or modesty you know bupakari and katanyu kata weti we learned from last week feel free okay feel free to go uh, extra mile to go deeper into those dhamma and and really uh, put them into practice and realize it because there are many layer to the dhamma study not just memorizing not just understand the theoretical part of the buddhist principle there's something more than that which we will talk about it today let's see if we can recap to what we learned last week through this exam example you can type in the answer into the chat box if you like what dhammas make people beautiful okay you should be answer this in one second <laughs> okay so the answer is easy right number c good khanti and soracha and this is the example of the uh, question in the exam okay, in the thai version just like this and the next one which virtue that protecting the world mindfulness clear comprehension sense of shame moral fear khanti so let's check so the answer is b right easy okay the next one which is not sampachanya i will not test you the pali if i give the pali i will have the english translation at the end so you know what that pali terms mean in the exam so which one is not sampachanya not difficult but have to think a little bit all right ready for the answer integrating wisdom awareness proficiency remembering and the correct answer is number d sampachanya is the wisdom element is the full comprehension full awareness is the proficiency if you go back and look to the file that material file that i sent you or the last video that we uh, learn you will find all of this term in the slide of the sampachanya what it means according to the tibidaka or the uh, to be precise from the abhidhamma that's trying to explain the word sampachanya okay so these are just the uh, example just to recap and uh, perhaps help you to wake up a little bit when you have a test right so okay so for today we will be covering the dhamma group 3 so last week remember group 2 today this week is a group 3 and there is 3/1 so that mean next week will be 3/2 because there are many dhamma that fall into the group of 3 and we cannot cover them all so i select some of them today we cover three of them and next week we continue to uh, cover the second part of the group 3 this include uh, the three gems or the triple gems we touch on the concept of the triple gems and the instruction of the buddha there are three thing that the buddha teach the buddha summarize his instruction to monks and the lay people to practice 
and we will touch on the concept of what is the good, what is the evil, or what is the bad through the lens of Buddhism, and what caused them to consider good or to consider bad. What are the roots cause of unwholesome or the kilesa? Sounds simple, right? When I look in the books. Which I believe you download them already. The triple gems: the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. And it gives explanation of who is the Buddha, what is mean by the Dhamma, what is mean by the Sangha. Within one or two minutes, you have the answer. And then it move on to the second group, which is the virtue of the three ratana or the three gems. And it go on to the three admonition of the Buddha or the instruction of the Buddha, abstaining from. Bad to do good and purify one mind, and that's it. It's not much detailed explanation of where they come from, why they're so important. Some may not feel motivated or practicing, and that's another thing. When it's come to the Buddhist study, come to the Buddhist take, come to the Dhamma study, the real Buddhist study, you go to the Tipitaka. What is Tipitaka? Tipitaka is the source that kept the teaching of the Buddha, right? So we learned last week there are the Vinaya Pitaka, which you learned yesterday from Prajan Choli, and the Sutta Pitaka, which kept the teaching of the Buddha, and the Abhidhamma Pitaka. There are three uh, Pitaka or three basket that kept all the teaching. But there's nothing fancy in this sacred text. It's just purely text. There's no picture. It sounds very boring when you go through the text. It's just line by line, letter by letter. And you try to figure out what exactly that the Buddha teach, what exactly that he mean by this sentence, and that's make the Tibetaka study quite challenging and more difficult, especially when someone try to study the Tibetaka on their own. So you need someone to guide you, you need teacher. And with this curriculum that designed by the Chiang Mai Sangha, this is help us to explore the Sutta Pitaka, including the Vinaya Pitaka. Okay, um, uh, in the proper structure, we will not touch on. The Abhidhamma uh, basket yet, that's separate. Okay, so but it doesn't mean that you cannot read it. It doesn't mean that you have to wait. If you want to know Abhidhamma, just go ahead and help yourself. You can you can find out what it is, all right. And that that's the thing. That three basket. So not much in the book, but the book is the framework. The book have all the list that decide for the elementary level student to be aware that these are the Dhamma, but it depends on the teacher. To select which dharma that he want to teach based on the time that we have together. So in this fifteen weeks, we have to cover all the way up to the dharma group ten, from group two to group ten. There are many of them, so many of them. They are in the book that you have. So please go through them all, but I will not cover all of them. I will select as I seen, you know, uh, maybe suitable or uh, interesting for most of us here. Okay, but don't stop here. Of what we learn in the class, go back and and study more by yourself. So let me start from here. The ending of Buddhism. This is quite scary. The ending of Buddhism that the Buddha mentioned himself in this Kim Kimula Sutra, Angkutara Nikai, six point four zero. Everything that I brought up here, I will give the reference at the end. If you are interested, you can go check. To the full sutra by yourself, but I just capture the highlight, something that I want to emphasize, that relevant to what we are learning on each particular session. The ending of Buddhism. That means Buddhism will be ended if this thing happen. So it is when the monks, the nuns, or bhikkhu or bhikkhuni, sometimes they call bhikkhuni a nun, and the laymen and laywomen. Lack respect and reverence for the teacher, who is the teacher. The teacher is the Buddha, and the Dhamma, or the teaching. Sometimes in some texts it uses the word teaching. In some texts it uses the word the true teaching. The Sangha, okay. So the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. The training, the concentration, which is meditation, and the heedfulness, and the hospitalities. After the final extinguishment of the Buddha, this is the cause. This is the reason why the true teaching again, true teaching is the Dhamma. Does not last long. 
after the Buddha passed away. p a r i n i p a n a or e n t e r n i p a n a There are some keywords here: the teacher, which is the Buddha, the Dhamma, which is his teaching, the Sangha or the group of people who study the teaching, the training, the meditation, the practice of peacefulness, and the practice of hospitality. If not, none of this is still, you know, being practiced by. Monks, nuns, and the laymen and laywomen. That means Buddhism will be ended very soon. Here, as I see, you come to study the teaching of the Buddha, and that gives hope to the life of Buddhism. As long as this congregation, Buddhist monk, uh, male monk, female monk, Buddhist monk and nun, laymen and laywomen, still eagerly study the teaching, that's a good sign. But if they study and don't practice, that's not good. So the second responsibility for us not only study to know what it is, so we need to practice. Why? If we don't practice, we will not realize the benefit of those dhamma that we learn from the the theory. What are the five precepts? Okay, one, two, three, four, five. I know that. Do you observe five precepts? That's the second question. If the answer is yes. Do you realize that precept is important to your life? How observing precept benefit your life, and when you realize that, no one can change it. Say, oh, don't uh, don't observe precept. No, you can because you know this is benefit you, and then there will be time that you feel confident, loving kindness toward people around you that encourage them to observe the precept just like you have been doing. So there's a lot of thing into it. So here in this community, that when we dedicate our time on this Sunday afternoon, Saturday afternoon to come to the class like this to me, this is amazing phenomenon. Please, please keep on going. Okay, and again, I know that many of you have to work. You know, have a lot of responsibility. If you miss the class, that's not a big deal. Just go back and relearn. It will be recorded and upload to the YouTube. Go back and relearn, and just let the in, uh, instructor know that you watched already. That's it. So start from the triple gems, the three jewels, three gems. There are many names to it. What's come to your mind when you hear the word gems? For the ladies, may think of the jewelry, right? The diamond, the ring. That's the idea of the gem. That's something that come to my mind too when I hear the word gems, and people give the uh, price to it. When you think of gems like this. This is the most expensive diamond, the auction in the 2023. It cost 44 millions. The blue loyal, I don't know who have it, but that's how much it cost. 44 million to buy this little stone. Why so expensive? Why this gem is so expensive? And why someone willing to buy it? If you have that much of money, do you want to buy it? My aunt, I think she sell. Jewelry. I saw this gem, you know, when I was young. For me, it means nothing. It's just the stone. Give me for free. I may not interested, even though it's cost a millions, because it doesn't mean anything to me. It's subjective, right? But for some of them, this is so beneficial. This is so valuable. It doesn't matter how much does it cost. I'm gonna have to buy it. I'm gonna have to own it. So the idea of gem. Refer to something that valuable, and this valuable come from your point of view. Human being, we are the meaning making machine. We give the meaning to everything. We give the price to everything. And if you buy it, why did you buy it? Does it make your life better? Does it make you look more beautiful or happier? What would be the reason why you want to be the owner of these little gems, right? Maybe because of the world said, "Wow." This is the rare item. You should have it. It's valuable. So the idea of valuable come from someone else. But through the lens of the m a t student, we should think differently. Everything in this worldly life, the worldly possession, worldly material, everything come with defilements. Come with defilements, and we will end up suffering. If a man bought this, forty-four millions. And in the next few week, he lost it. He would be in pain, right? Would be in so much suffering because he lost forty-four million stone. You see, it's come with uh, it's come with defilements. 
Many times we don't pay attention to what's come with it. We just keep on looking for it. So the idea of gem is, in this case, is something that valuable. But these valuable ideas come from your view, come from your understanding toward that uh, something that you are experiencing. Similar idea. In Buddhism, there are three gems. So this uh, is the sculpture in the British Museum that explain. They call the wheel of this tri ratana. Tri mean three. Ratana mean the gems. So number one, number two, number three. This three wheel refer to the three ratana or the tri ratana, which is again, the Buddha, is the first gem, the Dhamma is the second gem, and the Sangha is the third gem. So this is the first. Uh, Dhamma in group three that we need to understand. We will explore this concept together. What is the idea of the triple gems? Why the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha is worth is highly respect among Buddhist congregation. So we need to understand that. And these are the term that involve when you study by yourself. You may come across this term. They point to the same thing. The triple gems. The three gems, the three jewels, the three treasures, the three pillars—they point to the same thing. When you hear the word three gems or the three ratana, the three three ratana ratana means gems. The three gems. By default, right away, Buddhist people must think of number one, the Buddha gem; number two, the Dhamma gem; and number three, the Sangha gem. And keep in mind that gems mean something valuable. Buddha gem is valuable, Dhamma gem is valuable, and the Sangha gem is valuable. That's why we look at these three elements as something that very valuable. They are priceless. Buddhist people must understand why, why the Buddha gem, the Dhamma gem, and the Sangha gem consider invaluable. If we put into the picture, the first is the Buddha, second is the Dhamma, and the third is the Sangha. When we talk about sangha, we may think of a man who ordained or a woman who ordained, a bhikkhu or bhikkhunis or nuns. When we think of the Buddha, most people would think of this present Buddha or Prince Siddhartha who ordained, this historical Buddha that mentioned in the Buddhist text. But in fact, when we think of the Buddha in terms of the Buddha gem, this refer to all the Buddha in the past, those self enlightened being in the past, not just. This present historical Buddha, and when this come to the Dharma gem, right away you think of the teaching of the Buddha, which is fine. So today we're gonna explore deeper into the idea of the Dharma, because Dharma is the big word. Today you learn the word Karma, which most Buddhist people understand wrongly. When we they hear the word Karma, they think of something negative right away, negative action, which is incorrect, right? Karma is action, can be positive, can be negative, can be neutral too. It's not always bad. Same thing with the word dharma is one of the most vocabulary to translate. There are many meaning into it. You need to look into the context of what exactly that you are reading in that passage. What exactly that the Buddha mean? Your job when it's come to study the Buddhist text, you need to develop the detective mind to detect what's the meaning behind that. Just like you are the programmer, try to understand the coding behind that coding that you are working on. So dharma is a big word, and that is why many Buddhist scholar they don't translate dharma. They just use dharma as a dharma. They just use the word karma as a karma. They don't translate it. It make it easy. And now these day people seem to understand what is karma, what is dharma, what is sankhara. There are many terms that seem to be very confusing. So they that is why they don't translate it. But your job, you need to understand what it means by that particular context that you are studying, okay? And the sangha, sangha can be a group of those who study the dharma, monks, b i k k h u and b i k k h u n i male monk and female monk, lay man and lay woman as well. But in this case, according to the books that we use as a reference, the sangha point to a monk and a nun, people who actually leave home and ordain. And and study the teaching of the Buddha. So we will go to each one of these to get to know the idea of the Buddha, why the Buddha worth respect. Get to know the idea of the Dharma, why the Dharma is 
worth respect to get to know the idea of the Sangha and why the Sangha, okay, they are worth respect as well. Start from the Buddha first. Why the Buddha is worth respect? The question is, what's the difference between those Arahant and us as an ordinary human being? The Buddha is an Arahant. Not only he is an Arahant, he is a self-enlightened being. What is one thing that makes us different from them? Between those enlightened beings and us who are still trapped in this realm of existence, what is one thing? This sutra gives us some hint. It's quite interesting. There was the Brahmins, Dona Brahmin, Dona Brahm. So he was following the person who walked in front of him when he saw the footprint. He looked through the footprint on the ground and he know that this footprint is somebody. He is not a normal human being. So he walks behind and try to locate who is the owner of this footprint. And then he found the Buddha was sitting over there. So he asked the Buddha, Are you a Deva? What is Deva? Deva is a heavenly being. Just to keep it simple. The Buddha, he called Dona Brahmin as the Brahmins. He said, No, I am not a Deva. I am not a heavenly being. And why do you think that the Brahmin think that the Buddha is someone who is not ordinary man? According to the text, wherever the Buddha goes, he would have his aura, radiation okay, around his body all the time. He has a perfect feature, 32 features of the great man. Perfect. Eye, ears, nail, teeth, you name it. For us, we, we were born handicapped. You may feel like, why did you say that? I have everything. Why did you say I'm handicapped? Because if we compare ourselves to the standard man, standard feature, all of us here, we, con we can be considered handicapped. Because our nail, our finger, they're not in the same length. The ear is not the same size. The eyes not the same size. The nose, the mouth, the teeth is imperfect. But there's a perfect man feature that you can look through. The Buddha is the one who have that perfect feature because of his long journey of pursue perfection, accumulate perfection. That's why he born perfect in this life. Imagine yourself when you, if you have a chance to meet the Buddha yourself physically, you may not know he's the Buddha, but you will be noticed that this person is somebody. Same thing happened to this Dona Pram. So he walked after the Buddha. And when he get a chance, he asked this question, Are you the Deva? The Buddha said, No, I'm not. So are you the Gadapa? What is Gadapa? Gadapa is Khontan. Khontan is the, another form of heavenly being who more like a musician or entertainment people. He said, No, I'm not that Gadapa. Are you a Yakha? No, I'm not a Yakha either. Who is the Yakha? Yakha is the an angry angel. The, the person who always getting cranky, getting agitated easily when this person die, the mind with that quality is usually born in the realm of yakha. He said, no, I'm not, I'm not a yakha. And the last question, so are you a human being? The Buddha said, no, indeed, I'm not a human being. Why did he say that? He sit there, you standing here, you ask this question, are you human? He said, no, I'm not human. So this is the Buddha word. He said he is not human. So who is he then? What's the difference between he as an enlightened being and us here as a normal human being? Okay, so you may think about it. Some of you may know the answer already, right? Because the Buddha is a perfect man. His mind is pure. His mind doesn't have defilements. He was able to remove the defilements from his own mind completely by himself. No greed, no hatred, no uh, delusion, no ignorance. Completely gone. But for us as a human, another meaning of human that I like is human are the group of people or living beings who live by defilements. Correct me if I'm wrong. If we don't have defilements, then we're not human. We will be enlightened beings just like those Arahant in the past. But we still exist. These five aggregates still here because the condition is not right for us to leave this world yet. That's why we're still here. But in the mind of Arahant, they don't have defilement. For us, we do. We have a lot.
we have a lot of refinements. So we have to prepare for the rebirth, right? Continue to reborn and reborn for a really long, long time. The Buddha possess of the three virtues, the wisdom, the purities, and the compassion. This most Buddhists know. What is wisdom in this case? If you think of wisdom as smart, people who have wisdom, a person who is very smart, right? He has wisdom. He can teach himself and free himself from suffering, from the root cause of suffering. Nobody teach him. Super smart. The Buddha happened to be a very smart person, have a very keen sense of observation. He noticed when he was, uh, when Prince Siddhartha was living in the palace, right? So he observed that, oh, why people get ill, why people die, why my mom die. We have been to the funeral many times. We ourselves, we get sick from time to time. And we know that we are dying. Everyone know. Prince Siddhartha also know. But his observation is much deeper than us. Because when he observed, he realized that, hey, is there a way out of this problem? This is the serious world problem. It affects all of us. Some people that he loves are going to have to die too. He himself has to die too. Any way to end this. If there is the moon, there should be the sun. If there is hot, there should be a cold. If there is suffering, there should be the way to end suffering. That's how smart people think. And then he looked for the answer. Okay, he worked hard, tortured himself, self-modification. This, this. He did a lot of things. When I get back to the text and study the story of the Buddha, every time I feel appreciated. Prince Siddhartha or the Buddha to be have worked on himself very hard. He had gone to all kinds of hardship to find the truth, to find the cure of what caused me suffering. If I can figure out what caused me suffering, then I would be able to help myself, heal myself from this suffering. And that means I can help other too, people I love and people around the world, all beings, because we fall under the same law of nature. So wisdom in this case, the Buddha possesses wisdom. So he's smart, he can teach himself, he frees himself from suffering. And he discovered the Four Noble Truth, which we will not discuss today. Four Noble Truth is the advanced wisdom, advanced knowledge that a man can attain. The Buddha get there. He understands them all. What is the nature of Dukkha? What caused Dukkha? Can Dukkha be ended? And how to end Dukkha? This is, is the first virtue of the Buddha. And when he has wisdom, he, he did not just keep it for himself. He think of others too. He share what he learned. He spent 45 years teach people throughout India, near or far. In the morning when the Buddha wake up, he would meditate and he would locate someone who deserves his teaching today. No matter where that people would be, he will go find them and teach them. The teaching objective of the Buddha is very really clear. It's very really clear. It's one thing, and the one thing only is to help people, whoever he teach, to be free from suffering. That's the main teaching. When someone meet the Buddha, it's like whatever problem they have, they will feel relief. They will feel relief. Many people come to the Buddha and attain the Soda Patana, become the stream entry onward because of the Buddha is the great teacher and he has a kind heart. With loving kindness, with compassion, he did not keep the thing that he discovered for himself. He spent 45 years working hard day and night, even when he get old, teach people what he discovered, because the thing that he discovered is deep, is profound, extremely profound. And the Buddha, when he, when he achieved enlightenment, those Arahant, when they achieve enlightenment, they will have access to the called the higher wisdom. One of the things in this three higher wisdom is called the Asawa Kaya Yana, the knowledge that helped that person to remove the defilement from his or her own mind completely. It's called Asawa Kaya Yana. Yana means wisdom in knowledge. And when that happens, when you get to that wisdom, you remove, you uproot all the defilement from your mind. Then your mind is clean, your mind is pure, completely pure. That's why the Buddha, the second virtue of the Buddha is purity. So he is smart, he is pure, and he doesn't keep his wisdom with himself. He share with everyone around the world. 
and His wisdom only lead us to the good thing, to the good life, which is again is point to the Dhamma. We will be talking about the Dhamma in a moment. And this is considered the first gem, the Buddha gem. The Buddha has this wisdom. He worked hard for himself. He did not keep it for himself. He shared with everyone, and he also, he was able to purify himself, body, speech, and mind without any teacher. That's why he is worth respect. Without the teacher, there will be no teaching. Without the Buddha, there will be no Dhamma. That is why the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha go together. And group together is called the triple gems. It's something that's super valuable, extremely precious, that most Buddhists, all the Buddhists, should pay attention and pay high respect. Move to the second gem. It's called the Dhamma. The Dhamma gem. The Dhamma has many meaning. It can be the true nature or the law of nature. That's the truth, right? The nature. We born, we get old, we die. That's the nature. We understand that, and no one can. Can stop it from happening. It will, and it is happening. The Dharma can be translated to phenomena, something that happening in the mind. When you realize that is particular uh, Dharma, when you have a deep meditation, you experience this and that. Can be the internal phenomena or the external phenomena, something that we experience in this world. And the third one would be the teaching of the Buddha. The Dharma point to the teaching of the Buddha. But today I'm going to give you uh, more detail about the Dhamma. Like I said, we may not come back to this again as we go through this up to the advanced level. There's n- there's no topic like this waiting for you in the uh, intermediate and the advanced. Just go to something else. Go to the sutra. Go to some other topic. So I think it's good to lay down this foundation. So I may spend a little bit more time on this uh, particular idea of the the the, the Dhamma. When someone practice Dhamma. The Dhamma is something that that protect you, that shield you from the bad thing. That also consider Dhamma. But if you go through the dictionary, the Buddhist dictionary, the Dhamma has the root, and the root come from this idea. The meaning is to support, to hold, to sustain, to preserve, and to protect the barrier, the supporter. To uphold the character of the Dhamma is uphold. Uphold what? You think of if a man who never observed five precepts before, his life always run into trouble, right? Killing, lying, stealing, sexual misconduct, drinking, he bring himself into trouble. No, but nothing protect him, and he he didn't know why. And one day he come to study Dhamma just like us, and the monk teach him the five precepts. And he put into practice. Oh, okay. From now on, I will avoid killing or harming others. I will not uh, stealing someone's stuff. I will honest to my spouse. I will uh, telling. I will not telling a lie. I will stop drinking. So he put the five precepts into practice. On that moment, in that moment onward, he is being protected. The Dhamma is upholding him into the virtue, into the secure path of happiness. Because the moment that a man observe precept, he will not. Do something bad, physically and verbally, even though he might want to do it. But today, I observe five percent. So if someone says something bad to me today, I will not say something bad to that person. But only today, though. Tomorrow I will come back because tomorrow I will avoid the fourth percent. I will say something bad to you. So that means that day he is protected by the five percent that he observed, and this is the idea of dharma. The characteristics of dharma it will protect you, it will protect the people, or the person who observe or embrace on observing the dharma. So I will show you some of uh, other places that mentioned in the text when it come to the idea of dharma, what is dharma, how to practice dharma, because if you still remember, you learn from last week. After the Buddha passed, he did not appoint anybody to take over his place, but. He appoint the Dhamma and the Vinaya to be the teacher of the Sangha of the lay Buddhists in the future. So he did not select a human being. He did not select any individual. Instead, he select Dhamma and Vinaya. So that means the Dhamma and Vinaya, these two elements, they are important. They include the whole idea, the whole body of the teaching of the Buddha in these two elements. In this particular teaching, 
the Buddha said, whether the realized one arise or not. The realized one, you see another term that refer to the Buddha. The Tathakata, the awakened one, the realized one, point to the same person, which is the Buddha. Whether the Buddha exists or not, basically, this law of nature persists. This law of nature, they exist whether I'm arise, I'm here or not. This regularity of nature principle, this invariance of nature principle, specific conditionalities, don't worry about it. The law of nature, they already here, whether the Buddha exists or not. You may think of the, the law of common characteristic, right? Everything subject to what? Anichang tukhang anatta. Uh, anichang means is, is uh, impermanence, continue to change. Tukhang means it's unsustainable. It cannot stay the same. It's being oppressed. It's going to break apart. Something's going to go wrong. And the idea of anatta means usually translate to non-self, but it's difficult to understand. Anatta, you can think of something that uncontrollable. You cannot control whatever it is to be like that forever. Human, animal, object, you just cannot. This is the law of nature. Whether the Buddha exists or not, this thing already there. He just discovered it. He did not create it. A realized one understand, the Buddha understand this, comprehend it, and then he explain it, he teach, he asserts, he establish, he clarify, he analyze, and he review it. That is why the Buddha is worth respect, highly respect, because we live in the same world. We are under the same law of nature, but we don't know they exist. Our wisdom is not there. We're not smart enough to understand. We don't know what caused this behavior. We don't have an, any idea that why we do something bad, why people kill people, what behind the scenes, what drive that unwholesome behavior. Because we don't know that we don't know. We're born with ignorance. We don't know what's in the mind. We don't even know what the mind is. We seem to know that, okay, human being, we have body and mind, okay, and we know more about the body, how to take care of the body, how to eat, how to sleep, how to exercise, make sure that the body uh, healthy and live long. We, we seem to know that. But when it comes to the mind, we don't have much information. We don't know much. Where is the mind? What size of the mind? What color of the mind? What shape of the mind? Where is the mind in the body? If we believe that the mind exists, where is the mind exactly? We have no idea. The Buddha discovered human mind. He is the mind expert. He knows the mind from inside out. He knows that the mind, human mind is crowded. Human mind has something called the mental impurities come with us. He go all the way down to analyze, to find out where did this thing come from and how to remove them. And nobody in this world have this understanding. That's why we're still here in the realm of existence. I give the Dhamma talk in Thai and I ask the lay Buddhists who listen to the teaching, I ask them, how many Buddha do you think that exist in the past? Some of them say one, some of them say two, some of them say five. What, what would be the correct number? Is that correct answer? How many Buddha exist so far? Countless. Countless, right? Countless Buddha. That means there were people in the past who smart enough to understand this law of nature and train themselves to free themselves from those defilements and stop the rebirth cycle. There are countless of them, but we're still here. So that means we still don't know that we don't know. We don't even know why we're here. So this is the idea of the Dhamma. The Buddha is the one who discovered and he shared with us. So if you find a teacher like this, what should you do? Right? You go find his teaching. You learn from him. You pay respect to him. You give him some respect, right? And not just a normal respect. should be the high respect. Because there's nobody in this world that teach us how to stop the cycle of existence. How to have access to the uh, eternal happiness, sustainable happiness or nibbana. There's no such teacher exists if the Buddha did not exist. Okay? And in one teaching, the Buddha said, the one who see the Dhamma, see me. And the one who see me, see the Dhamma. Interesting. 
And if you go further, there is another teaching the Buddha says, the one who see Dhamma, see p a t i c c a s a m u p a b a d a The one who see p a t i c c a s a m u p a b a d a see the Dhamma. What is p a t i c c a s a m u p a b a d a Maybe new to some of us here as well. Okay, but again, we will not touch on that detail. The idea here is the Buddha point to something that hey, he he sees something. He see Dhamma. When we that mean when we see the same Dhamma, we see the Buddha too. If we think of this literally from what we just read, the one who see me see the Dhamma. The one who see the Dhamma see me. The one who see the Dhamma see p a t i c c a s a m u p a b a d a The one who see p a t i c c a s a m u p a b a d a see the Dhamma. So that mean is the Dhamma refer to p a t i c c a s a m u p a b a d a or The Dhamma refer to the Buddha himself. You see how deep we can go when it's come to study the Dhamma or the teaching of the Buddha. So today, like I said, I like to spend uh, more time on this area because Dhamma is the big word. I want student to understand when it's come to study the teaching of the Buddha. So let's go to another one. This give us the character of the Dhamma in a short version. These things are skillful, blameless, praised by sensible. People, wise people, and when you undertake them, they lead to the welfare and happiness. This is dharma. We don't know what it is, but if we practice them, they will protect us from the bad thing. That's the idea of the dharma. Because sometimes people don't know. Oh, this teacher say this, that teacher say this, and each teacher claim that his teaching is true, the other teaching is wrong, and they get confused. When the Buddha passed by that town, those villagers seek advice from the Buddha. The Buddha, which one is true? Which one should I follow? People say, "Oh, you kill, you okay? There's no sin." Another teacher said, "No, don't kill. It's breaking precept. It's considered bad." And these villagers they get confused, and this is what the Buddha gave them: the general idea. If you practice like this, this is considered a good teaching. Put into practice, it it lead life to uh, happiness, okay, to the welfare and happiness of those who practice. Whatever you learn, you will prove that by yourself. This is something that I really enjoyed it. This is the teaching that the Buddha gave to Arahant Gotami, stepmother of Prince Siddhartha, who happened to be the first female monk in the history of Buddhism. She seek advice from the Buddha, and the Buddha gave this teaching. And after she listening to this teaching and put into practice, she attain arahantship, become free from defilements. And to me, this is the standard when it come to the word dharma. And back then, in the first twelve years, the Buddha did not give out any rules or the binaya. This you cannot do, that you cannot do. No, there's no such rule exists in the first twelve years. It's about dharma. It's about virtue. It's about something good, something wholesome that people practice. And here, let's take a look together. What's the standard of the idea of dharma? If we don't know the Buddhist text, if we never read it, and we want to be good person, we want to practice dharma. As people said, oh, you practice dharma or not? And what is dharma? So take this as the criteria or as the standard. So these qualities lead to this passion, not to passion. If something that leads to passion, most likely, it's not the dharma. The craving of tanha, karma tanha, p a w a t a n h a v i p a t a n h a It's to be detached, okay? Being detachment, not to bondage. Detached, freedom of mind. The reason we have bondage, because what? Again, behind the scene, there's a craving that run our life that cause us to crave for something, cling on something, and and attach to something, and then we end up suffering. Dismantling, not accumulating. And one of the the training of instruction to the monk, the Buddha. This is this is many of them of this that the Buddha teach the monk. The the monk should be trained themselves like this. Let go, not accumulating, have less item in life, so you your life can be free. That is why Buddhist monk allow only to have only eight item. When someone become a monk, you have robes, you have bow, you have a water flask, you have needle, you have a razor to shave your head, you have belt, you have skirt. That's it. That's all you have. You are free, so have less. Okay, less is more. How can we put this into practice? If you look at your c l o s e t s 
how many how many thing in the closet that you have not used in the past six months but still there or still keep on buying them this is the idea of the dharma okay modesty not strong desire just keep on buying stuff without using it because the reason we buy it because they're on sale we hope to use it in the future but we never use it we never feel content always feel discontents and then compare oh uh, how come he has iphone 15 but i already have iphone 14 you start complaining to your mom and your dad and demand to have the iphone 15 and then iphone 16 iphone 17 never feel content even though the phone the phone that you have is working fine but we just don't appreciate it we don't feel content this is not the dharma seclusion okay not to company keep in mind that when someone practice the dhamma when the buddha give the teaching to someone especially in this case she is the bhikkhuni she ordained the first female monk when someone become a monk that person aims specifically to attain nibbana as quick as possible so the instruction of the buddha that given to this gotami bhikkhuni is to help her to attain nibbana so seclusion is one of the training that most monk and female monk need to practice to be secluded. That's why many people live in the forest, secluded. But in your case, as a lay people, you don't have to do that. When you study, you need to think, how can I put this into practice? Associate with people too much usually bring more headache, right? Go to the party, drinking, dancing. There's a lot of things that involve when you go out a lot, when you hang out with the crowd. Because people in this world, they don't have precepts. They don't even know what precept means. So you live in the world that people lack of this right understanding of living wholesome life. To arouse persistence, not to laziness. You see, laziness is another name of defilement. It's another name of defilement. Become lazy. If you feel someone invite you to go study Dhamma or practice meditation, and another person invite you to go watching movie or go to the party. So which one lead you to the Dhamma path, which person or which friend is considered good friends who give, uh, who have your best interest for you to live a good life. Now you know, oh, okay, this is what the Buddha said. It aroused to something good, right? Uh, to persistent, not to be lazy, to go meditate, don't quit. When you sign up for this class, don't just quit. Later on, you may realize, oh, I have a lot of work. Let, let me do it next year. That this Dhamma program only open once a year. This is elementary level, and then the next one we open the intermediate and continue with the advanced. And we come back again next year or next round for the uh, elementary level. If you feel like you want to quit, that means you know you have this defilement take control of your mind. Again, this is the Dhamma. And the last one is being unburdensome, not being burdensome. Something that trouble you, something that give you worry. If you are about to do something, you may not know that is this correct or is this incorrect if you ask yourself five years from now when i look back to what i about to do will i feel guilty if the answer is 100 percent surely i will not feel guilty then do it it's considered dhamma but if you know for sure that i may feel guilty of what i about to do even though it's a little guilty a little guilt that means it's not the dhamma if you want to shit on the exam you did not prepare for the exam and then you decided to cheat on the exam so you don't look bad you know when you get the score to show the score to your parent or your friend in the class this is not the dhamma this is not the teaching of the buddha to cheat on the exam to cheat on your spouse it will lead to problem in the future and with this mind when you go meditate when this incidents or the thing that you have done in the past pop up in your mind your mind will be crowded you will have worry of the wrongdoing that you did in the past. And that's crowded the mind. And this is not good. The mind should be in the state of clear and calm and bright at all time. But there's something that costs us, right? If we have the wrongdoing in the past and we think of it, that energy will come back. So this something, if we can summarize, you can think of the characteristics of the Dhamma in these four things. It's good in the beginning, it's good in the middle, it's good in the, at the end. When you practice five precepts, your life is being protected right away in that very moment. It's good at the beginning of day one. It's good during that 
practice is good during the end of your life, at the end of your life. That's the Dhamma. Giving the same. Observing precept the same. Meditation the same. Study Dhamma the same. Today you come to the Dhamma teaching maybe some of you for the first time. May feel difficult at the beginning. But if you don't quit, you have patience. You have khanti. You learned patience last week. Like you have to motivate yourself to get going. You see, this is benefit you, right? So it's good at the beginning of you learn the Dhamma, even though you may not understand 100%. But it's always good because Dhamma is good. Doesn't matter how much you understand because this is a good stuff, the good thing that the teaching of the Buddha happening not because he go, he go read the book, he go try to figure it out by himself. No. His teaching comes from enlightenment, enlightenment, from seeing. The Dhamma is in us, in, 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 in the mind. Because when he achieved enlightenment, the Buddha did not talk to anybody. He sat there underneath the bow tree. He closed his eyes and he did something with his mind. And then he realized that truth, that true nature of things. Then he shared with us. So it's always good at the beginning, in the middle, and at the end. That's the character of the Dhamma. It leads to the less, it lesson. It helps us to listen. These three unwholesome root: greed, hatred, delusion. We will talk about this today. And also it leads to the welfare and happiness for yourself and for people around you and for the world at large. You may feel like, oh, I observe precept. What's, what's so beneficial? It just protect me. No. The Buddha said, if you protect yourself, you protect the world around you. Think about it. I was so amazed with this short teaching. If one protect oneself, one protect the world. If you don't kill, you make the world a better, a safe place to live, right? If you don't lie, you don't steal stuff, wherever you go, you are a harmless person. You give this feeling to people around you that, hey, having this kind of people around my company, my family, my community will be safe. Imagine if the whole village just observed five precepts. You can park your car anywhere. You can leave your wallet anywhere. Nobody steal anything from anybody because they observe precepts. And the last one, skillful, blameless, and praised by the wise. This is the collector. Uh, characteristic of the Dhamma. And Dhamma has level. Most people only think of Dhamma as the first level. Pariyati. Pariyati means you study. Study what? Study the theory. In this case, we point to the Tipitaka or the Buddhist text. The Buddhist text is considered the primary source that keeps the teaching of the Buddha. So if you want to know the, the the authentic teaching of the Buddha, the closest real teaching of the Buddha, you need to go to the primary source, which is the Tipitaka. That's the idea. This is called Pariyati. That means you're studying. And you come to this study, uh, Dhamma study program in this elementary level. You are working on the first level of Dhamma. It's called Pariyati. You're studying. And it's not just that. The second layer of the Dhamma is called Patipati, or practicing. Like I said, if you memorize all of this that we learn up to the advanced level, you know all the five precepts, you know all the dependent origination, the twelve link, understand them all. But you are breaking precept every day. You still feeling okay to lie, still feeling okay to to kill, to harm someone, and don't feel shameful of anything. That means this is not the dhamma. This is not the idea of study dhamma or the teaching of the Buddha. The more you study the more good person you will become. And the last one, the third level, which is the highest level when someone comes to the teaching of the Buddha, is called realizing or patiwetha. You need to know, people say meditation is good. At the beginning, you may have no idea why meditation is good. So you learn the theory, you learn all the technique. There are 40 techniques mentioned in the Buddhist text. You go through them all. Or now you pick one, and then you practice. But you don't see the result. People said, oh, you might will be relaxed, you will be feeling joy and pity and sukha and ekakata. You feel ubekha. You will enter the first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, but you never have that experience. So your confidence of practicing those meditation, meditation techniques will not that high, and eventually you quit. So you need to be patient. Have faith with your technique. Have faith with your teacher and fully submit you to that teaching. Until you realize it, oh, meditation is so good. Now I, I have a sharp mindfulness. I have a sharp awareness. I can sense when something's going to go wrong. When someone says something bad, I will not feel agitated at all. 
And when you realize this, this is the real Dhamma. That means you have complete practice the Dhamma. You know the theory. You know how to practice, and you have the result of that practice of the practice of that Dhamma, and that gives you confidence of the word Dhamma. And then, you know, perhaps if you high enough, you may share this Dhamma to others around you. Okay, so don't just uh, be focused on study the text, know all the sutra, but still live life unhappy. A Dhamma student should be happy. That's how I see it. If you feel like you are unhappy person for some reason, that means the way you practice dhamma may be incorrect. You need to think what went wrong. How come at the end of the day I don't feel happy? Today you come to the class, and when the class finish, you go home, start yelling to your spouse, your children, this and that, kick your dog, this and that. Hey, where did the good things go? Where did the dhamma that you learn about patience, about khanti, about soratcha? About mindfulness, about awareness. Where did those things go? Where did those quality go? After you learn them all, so pariyati, pati pati, and pati vedha need to go together, and that will make you a happy being. We may not realize nibbana this lifetime, or even in the future lifetime. We don't know when, but as we put the dharma into practice correctly, whoever you are, as a boss, as a father, as a son, as a wife. As a monk, as a novice, you will be a wiser person, more ethical person, more mindful person. Okay, you will have a caring heart. Not the the longer you practice dharma, you should have less and less selfish. Should should be more kind, more generous, more loving kindness, and and that make you a happy man. Doesn't matter how much money you have in the bank account. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter how much education you have. You know the dharma. Dharma protect you. Dharma make you happy, and that's the dharma gem is worth respect. Now the third gem is called the sangha. Sangha. Okay, I will use the reference according to the book that we use in this class. Sangha point to someone who ordain. Bikuni, uh, a biku, a bikuni, mang or nuns that ordain. These people, the they play an important roles. When it come to the triple gems, but before we go to that, there are two kind of sangha. The first call, Arya sangha. Arya mean noble sangha. Who are the noble sangha? Noble sangha are the group of people who, who train themselves well till they achieve, uh, arahant. They become a noble. They start from the first level of the stream when a stream entry, the soda patana, saka thaka anaka and arahant. So they are able to train themselves to remove, train themselves according to the teaching of the Buddha, and remove the, a certain group or certain set of defilement from their mind until all the way up to the arahant level where they they can do what the Buddha did to remove the defilement from the mind completely. This called the noble sangha, and the conventional sangha, conventional conventional sangha, or samutti sangha. This refer to the sangha just like myself, just like all the monk here. We not achieve anything yet. Uh, we are, we still have defilement, but we want to be a better person. We want to be a better monk. We want to realize nibbana someday, and we don't want to waste time doing the thing that the lay people do in the worldly life. So we decided to leave everything behind and become a monk and walk on the highway of life to follow the teaching of the Buddha intensively, hoping that one day uh, it will help us to shorten the path toward nibbana, the path to nibbana. Okay, so the the sangha preserve the teaching of the Buddha. The sangha protect the teaching of the Buddha. Preserve means they study, they memorize, and then they pass on. So they protect when there is the enemy, when there is the war, when there is something that jeopardizes or endanger Buddhism. They protect the teaching of the Buddha, and they propagate, they expand the teaching of the Buddha. Without the sangha in the past, we wouldn't have this lecture today. Nobody would put everything into the books, and we have no access to the teaching of the Buddha. If you get lost, forty, four hundred years after the Buddha passed, his teaching will uh, have been gathered together in the form of writing format for the first time. Without them, those group of great monks work hard, try to make this thing happen. There wouldn't be us here sitting there, and talk about the Dhamma because we don't know where to find the Dhamma. Everything would get lost in time, right? And the last one, the sangha consider the merit field of the world because they observe precept. 
they have a pure precept, they have a nice manners. So the Sangha also consider one of the gem that's worth respect. And when you say Buddhang Saranang Kachami, Dhammang Saranang Kachami, Sangkang Saranang Kachami, you say that, oh, I go to the Buddha for refuse, I go to the Dhamma for refuse, I go to the Sangha for refuse, because they are, they are the triple gems, There's something that worth respect. So we seek to rely on them, rely on the Buddha as the teacher who show us the way out of the cycle of existence, of the way to end the suffering. We uh, uh, go to the Dhamma to adopt, to apply the Dhamma into our life so we can live life happier, we can be better. And we seek for the Sangha, uh, refuge for the Sangha, because the Sangha are the group of people, again, who, who study the teaching, who preserve the teaching, and who pass on the teaching for the future generation for us. Yeah, this is just the meaning, okay, why the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha are considered the triple gems when you do the chanting, right? Adahang Samma, Sambuto, Pakawa, the blessed one is worth and rightly self-awakening. Buddhang Apiwantang Apiwa Temi, I bow before the awakened or the blessed one. That's the meaning. Same thing with the Swakato Pakawata Tammo. The Dhamma is well expelled by the blessed one. That means, in this case, you see the Dhamma means the teaching of the Buddha, something that he discovered and he teach us. Dhammang Namasami, I pay homage to the Buddha. And Subhati Pano Bhakavato Savaka Sangho, the Sangha of the Blessed One, the Sangha of the Blessed One, disciples, has practiced well. Sangkang Sanang Kashami, Sa I pay respect to those Sangha. That means when someone ordained, you have responsibility to train yourself to be worth respect, to worth re receiving the bow and the offering from the lay people. It's come with duty. Okay? If the monk doesn't observe precept or don't observe precept, that the monk and the lay people will be the same. So we don't deserve the bow, we don't deserve the offering from them. So monk, the only difference between monk and the lay people is the precept they observe, not just the hairstyle, not the color or the outfit that they wear. Monk have 220 precepts, right? You learned yesterday, the nun has 311 precepts. The lay people, sometimes five, sometimes eight, the no with 10. You see this, this precept, the difference, because there's a lot of things into it that help us to help monk and nun to be more mindful, to live life toward the path of Nibbana. Okay, so in short, this is the three gems, the, the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. The Buddha refers to the self-enlightened being, the Dhamma refers to the teaching, and there are two groups of Sangha, the noble Sangha, which they no longer hear. The only thing, uh, when and we, there's a, another thing called the conventional Sangha, which is the monk and nun that still you know, walk down the earth at the moment, study the teaching and protect and, and expand the teaching of the Buddha. So these are the triple gem that's worth respect. So now we move on to the second group, which is the um, uh, the instruction of the Buddha. This is from the Ovata Patimokha. The Buddha summarized the instructions to the monks, okay, 1,250 monks on the Mahabusha day before they go back wherever they're from. The instruction of the Buddha is this one, not to do any evil, number one, and to embrace on the good, number two, to do the good thing, and number three, to purify one mind. If someone asks, what did the Buddha teach? This may be the answer if you like to give. Definitely correct. Not to do the bad thing, not to continue to do the good thing, and purify one mind. The next question is, what is considered bad? And what is considered good? The Buddha did not just give the broadened framework to do things. He go precisely. He gave us the definition. In the first teaching of Dhammachaka, Potana Sutra, if you remember or if you pay close attention, you will notice that the Buddha already gave the differenti differentiation and the definition of what he means by the good and what he means by the bad. So instruction of the Buddha, again, abstaining from all evil, embrace on to do the good. Whatever consider bad, little or uh, minor or major, don't do it. And whatever consider good, okay, small or big, please do it. And the last thing which you may not find in other uh, religions is to purify one mind from the defilements, of the defilement. That's something interesting. Every uh, school of thought teach not to do bad, teach us to do good. But the definition of bad and good may be different 
may be different. So you have you can go and, and you may find uh, information more later on. Among Andalay people, we follow the teaching of the Buddha. The Buddha point us to the final destination in life. It's called Nibbana. You get there some some day, some some time in the future. We just don't know when. But to be precise, if you have no idea how to be happy and how to live good life and how to get there, the Buddha said, "Oh, don't do bad, do good, and meditate, purify one mind, keep it simple." But here we should know more than this. We should know what it means by evil, bad, what it means by good, and what it means by purify one's mind. This is a difficult question. We learn that the teaching of the Buddha has eighty-four thousand. Teaching that keeps in the Buddhist text, and it can be summarized into three headings, three groups, which is the group of sila, the group of mind, and the group of p a n j a or wisdom. Right? It's called the three four training. That's the name or the trisikha, trisikha. And how can we relate them to the instruction of the Buddha that he just mentioned? That oh, okay, I teach you not to do bad, to do good, and to purify your mind. How can we fit this? Into the framework of the t r i s i k a or the three four training, which again the short format of the eight four path. Which one is not to do the evil? We have one sila, two samadhi or the mind, and three the p a n j a or wisdom. Which one is considered not to do any evil? This is sila. Which one is considered to embrace on the good? This one go to number two. Which left us the last one, right? To purify one mind, go to number three. So you may confuse why first one seem to be understandable, not to do evil, not to do evil. Body and speech is considered precept. <clears throat> That makes sense. To embrace on the good, to do good, to do good. Why point to samadhi? Actually, the word samadhi. When you hear the word samadhi in this framework, you need to think of the original Pali. It's called citta. Citta means the mind. The first one is the sila or the precept development. You develop your body and speech to be pure. You purify that thing. It's called not to do the bad thing, but to do the good thing. You need to purify the mind so your mind can have more mindfulness, more awareness, more hiri, more o t a p a right? More khanti, more patient, more s o r a j a more modesty. More forgiveness. So this is the quality of the mind that consider good. So that means uh, that's why it's fall into the second group. And to purify one mind, consider the panya because the highest panya or the highest wisdom is called b a w a n a m a w a n a maya panya. Sorry about my writing. It's called b a w a n a There are three level of wisdom in Buddhism, right? Sut, uh, uh, sutta maya panya. The wisdom that come from learning is a learned wisdom. You go, you don't know something, you go learn, and then you know. And the second wisdom is called j i n t a m a y a p a n y a You, you reflect of what you learn. In Buddhism, the Buddha point to something higher than that. He call b a w a n a m a y a p a n y a That means the meditation that come from seeing. And how can we see? To be specific, we need to meditate so we can see. See from the inner eye, not see from these physical eyes. And that's another topic that we may discuss later in the future. That is why to purify one mind, to achieve enlightenment, your mind need to be clean. And how can you clean your mind? You need to develop that advanced level of meditation to access to that uh, that ability to clean the mind through the meditation practice. That's why it's called b a w a n a m a y a p a n y a and it fall into the group of p a n y a Okay, all right. So if you want to put into practice, this is how you put into practice. As a monk. When the Buddha trained the monk, the Buddha usually give the framework of the t r i s i k a which is the short format of the eight four path. The monk follow the sila, the samadhi or the mind developments, and the third one is the p a n j a or the wisdom development, sila samadhi p a n j a And sometimes you hear the word, the group of another set of teaching called the dana, the sila, and the bawana. This is the instruction that the Buddha usually give to the lay people. The dana is mean giving, right? Teach someone to give it easy, easier than the the precept. Precept is more difficult. When you have something, can you can give right away? But precept, you need to have more understanding. You have to have more patience, not to harm someone, not to telling a lie, not to stealing someone's stuff, not to intoxicate yourself. 
precept is more difficult. And then bhavana, bhavana means meditation. Meditation is, it doesn't cost anything. However, it's the most difficult thing to practice. If you said go to sit 30 minutes, can you do that every day? It's difficult. We know that difficult because they're already five minutes telling us to do something else. Don't just sit, right? But uh, for the monks, monk, we don't work for money. We don't have money. But uh, we still practice the dana to give the dharma talk, to forgiveness, this and that. There are many things, many ways to give, to practice the giving. But most likely, the starting point of someone becoming a monk, the Buddha, uh, teach the monk to, to, to develop their physical and their verbal to observing precept or the Vinaya. Vinaya has nothing to do with the mind. It's mainly focused on your, your behavior, what you do and what you say. And then when your body and speech are pure, now your mind becomes soft, it's ready for you to move on the mind development or the meditation or the samadhi. And when you meditate long enough, you have access to the highest level of wisdom. It's called panya, the ability to see things the way they are, to understand the five aggregates, and to understand how the trilakana or anichang tukang anatta work, and to understand how to remove the defilement from your mind. So now come to the last one, which is the... Um, what is the good and the bad uh, described by the Buddha? Today you hear the word tucharit, right? Tucharit and sucharit from Longpi Varavut. They are human being. We can commit the karma in three ways: to the body, to the speech, and to the mind. The unskillful action and skillful action. Okay, to the body, to the speech, and to the mind. There are three ways, and if we put everything together in one slide, this is how you see it. You may not realize that this already mentioned in the Dhammajaka Pada Sutta. The Buddha mentioned that uh, we can do the karma three ways, right? To the body, kaya karma. To the speech, ovachi karma. To the mind, omano karma. Whatever you do, physically, verbally, and mentally, that's considered action. That's considered karma. And karma has two groups. The first group is called wholesome. Unwholesome karma. Second group is called wholesome karma. They are opposite. Okay, don't be intimidated by a lot of text. They're very easy to follow. Start from the first group, the group of body. If you do this, it's considered bad. Killing, stealing, sexual misconduct. Bodily action like this is considered unwholesome or aku sala thamma. It's bad. Don't do it. If you do opposite. It's called good, it's called wholesome, it's called kusala. Abstaining from killing, abstaining from stealing, abstaining from sexual misconduct. This is considered good physical action. Go ahead and do it. When it comes to speech, or what kamma, if you do this, it's considered bad. Don't do it. Okay. False speech, slander, slanderless speech, divisive speech, and idle shatter or frivolous speech, something that doesn't beneficial, it's considered bad. Oppositely, if you do this four thing, it's considered good speech, good verbally action. Abstaining from foul speech, abstaining from slanderless speech, abstaining from divisive speech, abstaining from frivolous speech. Number one, number two, number three, this is the first precept, right? Abstaining from killing, abstaining from stealing is the second precept, abstaining from Sexual misconduct is the third precept. And these four are the fourth precept in the five precepts. They're not mentioned intoxication here. But most Buddhists will be familiar with the concept of the five precepts. So you can use the five precepts as a framework of what consider good and what consider bad to make it easy. And when it comes to the mind, manokamma, these three things consider bad, bad thinking. Thinking of a picha who think or a covetousness of think because of greed, want something from someone wrongly. Okay, payabad or ill will, want to hurt someone and harm someone. And the micha titi is a wrong will. This is difficult to understand. What is wrong will, what is right will. We need to study the uh, the principle of the eight four path, then we understand this one more. Oppositely, these three things consider good thinking. Thinking of non-greed, non-covetousness, thinking of non-evil, non-hatred, 
thinking of non-dilution or right view. So today, just see this picture, see this picture, and 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 go back and reflect on it. And there are the root cause of what caused people to do good and to do bad, right? The term in Pali called kilesa, or the mental impurities, unwholesome. This is unwholesome. This is wholesome. They are opposite. The unwholesome root. There are three things or three kilesa. The first one is called lopa or greed. Second one is called dosa or hate or anger, and the third one is called moha or delusion. They are the three major root cause of defilements. There are many defilements in this world, but when you track them down, you will coming down to these three things: either hate, either greed, or either delusion, or sometimes the combination. That's the nature of the mind. To understand this more clear, if someone come from the background of Abhidhamma, they will have much, much clearer understanding of how this defilement work. You think of this this root of the poison tree. There are three poison tree that come from the same root. The root is avicca here. Start from avicca, it become lopa. It become dosa. It become moha. These three guys, they work for this guy, or avicca. Avicca go out to moha. Avicca go out to dosa. Avicca go out to lopa. They are the three viruses that created by someone, and that one or that thing is called the avicca. Lopa is greed, right, or lust. Uh, dosa is anger, resentment, wishing someone to hurt someone, to harm someone. And delusion is something that you don't understand. You you have you feeling lost. That's why you make a mistake. How do you know that low part take control your mind? This is the idea. Low part. You think of hungry when you feel hungry. You may not see the low part, but you can you can observe. Now low part take control my mind. When you start like something, it's come from greed, and when you Start to don't like something or dislike something that usually come from dosa. You feel heat. You feel that you have to destroy something. You have to do something. Take action. Hurt someone. Say something bad to someone. That dosa. And moha is you think of the darkness. You feeling lost. It's the dullness of the mind. It's unclear. We don't know how to go left or go right. That's the idea of moha. That's why we make decision. Moha is difficult to observe. But lopa and dosa is not so bad, right? If you go to the shopping mall, something on sale, you don't need it, you still want to buy it. You see the new iPhone, iPad, you want to buy it. That's easy to relate it to the idea of lopa, something that you don't need it, but you want you want it anyway. Dosa again, getting angry, want to hurt someone, to harm someone, and you just like you burning your mind. You have heat in the mind. You cannot go to sleep. You keep burning yourself. There are detail to these three uh, defilements that we can go deep in the later session or in the future, and and because of this, the karma, the defilement, and the vipaka or the the result of the the karma. That's why we still here in the cycle of existence because of the defilements that force us to commit the karma, and every karma that we create, they come with the result or the vipaka. It never ended. And because of ignorance or avicca, to prevent preventing us from knowing this cycle, the vicious cycle. That's why that we are trapped in the realm of existence. And this is may seem advanced, may seem difficult to understand. But you see how clever of the Buddha. He said, if you don't know anything, if you don't remember anything, this is what you should do. Take this advice. Don't do bad. Do something good and keep on meditating. That's it. That's it. General, whatever you consider bad, don't do it. Whatever you consider good, do it. Make sure you don't stop practicing meditation. That's the bottom line. You may not know the defilement. You may not remember their name. It's okay. Go from here. To me, this is the easy, uh, 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 a practical form of teaching that we can put into practice right away, according to the teaching of the Buddha. All right, so I think we done for today. Sorry, a little bit that I went over time. 
I haven't covered a little bit thing, but it's okay. So go through this vocabulary uh, on your own. Okay, we learn about the triple gems. We learn about the Dharma, the Karma, the Kilesa, the Lopa, the Dosa, the Moha, the Abhishar. Just get to know this term because as uh, if you are serious Buddhist uh, study student, you're gonna come across this term often. So at the end of each lecture, I will try to give the list of the vocabulary that you should go over on your own and get familiar with them. Check out this two sutra if you like on your own free time. Okay, hope everyone learned something new today. All right, so we pay respect to the triple gem and then we take a break. <laughs>